So 41 through 50 now. Uh, 41 is a tricky question. It's electrochem. It's looking at a specific type of battery, a lead acid storage battery, which is a car battery. And we're looking at the reduction on top, oxidation on the bottom. So it says, which of the following decreases as the battery is discharged? So the assumption here is that they've written these in the forward direction. The discharge meaning as written, as opposed to being charged, which also happens if you drive, or they would occur in reverse. So we're, we want to look at the condition of the lead as we're starting here. We're starting with lead 4 plus, and then lead with uh, neutral metal, and they're both turning into lead 2 plus. Okay, so when we get down to here and it says which concentration decreases, the H plus, well as this progresses, the H plus is going to decrease, this is going to get used up. However, the lead 2 plus is going to increase in concentration as we move forward, or it's going to stay the same depending on how critical you look at it. There will be some slight solubility of this at a KSP equilibrium level. It will be mostly in the solid state, but we expect the concentration to either go up or stay the same. So therefore, we know that in terms of decreasing, only one would occur. Okay, 42 is a question that you don't have to get into too many steep calculations here. Uh, the critical thing you want to remember is for a standard reduction potential, the assumption is that all the solutions are of one molar concentration, and then link that back to acid base, the pH of a one molar H plus concentration would be zero. So we would have a pH of zero. Uh, we should expect that we have a 1.23 volt potential. So now we go through and look at our graphs, and we see which ones start at a pH of zero at 1.23. C starts above 1.6. That's incorrect. D starts at 0.8. That's incorrect. So we're looking at either A or B. Now we want to go through and figure out, okay, what's going to happen over time? Or I'm not sorry, time. As I increase the pH and my H plus concentration goes up, I'm either looking at a decrease in voltage or I'm looking at a static voltage. And we know, of course, that if we alter this concentration, that according to Nerd's law, we're going to see a drop in voltage, and therefore D is the best choice. Okay, here we're looking at a phosphorus atom and wants to know for N3L1 and ML-1, how many electrons there are. So N equals 3 is the third energy level. L equals 1 means we're looking at a 3P electron. So we have three different 3P electrons. We have a 3PX, 3PY, 3PZ. Okay, and for phosphorus, of course, we have 3P3. So we have a single electron in each. Any one of those three could be M equals minus one, it doesn't matter, they all have one electron, and therefore our best answer is B, one electron. Okay, 44 is, is a tough one, you should be able to narrow it down. Uh, after that, there's not really anything good you could do, so we have silicon, phosphorus, germanium, and arsenic. Uh, I don't want to make sure I don't mess this up, so we have silicon, germanium, uh, phosphorus, and arsenic. Okay. So we know that in terms of first ionization energy, as we're moving this way, so we know that this would be the highest on this end. This would be the lowest. So we know germanium is going to be the lowest. We know phosphorus is going to be the highest. And then additionally, we want to look for any quantum weirdness. So these are going to be P2. These are going to be P3. So we're not dealing where we go from having you know, a half filled to an extra electron somewhere. And that pairing, of course, makes it easier to remove. We don't have any of that going on. So we're just looking at which one of these is going to be you know, the lowest of the two, lower of the two, and the higher of the two. So we definitely want to see, so we're looking at increasing order. So we want to see phosphorus over here. So that gets rid of A and B. And we want to see germanium over here, the lowest. So really we're looking at you know, which one is lower, silicon or arsenic. And to kind of answer that question, you have two competing factors. In silicon, your electrons are closer to the nucleus but in arsenic, you have an additional proton for that higher effective nuclear charge. So the question really is about which one of those do you think will have a greater effect, the extra proton or being slightly closer to the nucleus. And you have to keep in mind that this is at n equals three, and this is at n equals four, and as we increase in energy levels, what we would expect is that they become very close together, and therefore we would expect the extra proton to make this higher and this to be lower. So we're looking for arsenic and therefore C would be the better choice. 
Um, but really, if you can whittle that down to C or D and then just kind of guess from there, then you're probably looking pretty good. Forty-five. Uh, this one is a little bit of a trap question. There's two plausible answers that they're trying to trick you with. Um, we're looking at three D seven, four S two, three D seven. Okay, and that totals out to be twenty-seven electrons. So how about this? Cobalt has twenty-seven electrons. A lot of people are going for that, but some people will catch copper two plus, and that has twenty-nine electrons for copper minus the two, twenty-seven. The difference is that the copper 2 plus is going to remove its 4s electrons. So this would be in a 3d9 state. Or, and so, so therefore this is not going to be the copper 2 plus. And our better answer of the two would be B, cobalt. Okay, you always remove the 4s electrons where those transition metal ions. Okay, in 46, the key detail you want to know about this is again the spacing of the electron energy levels. So when we're looking at hydrogen and we have the first energy level, and then we go to the second energy level. The next energy level is much, much closer than, than the gap between those two. And they continue to get smaller and smaller gaps as we get higher and higher. So it turns out that the gap from one to two is greater than the gap from two to infinity. Maybe they're equal, but I think it's actually larger. When we're looking at transitions occurring to the first energy level or from the first energy level, that's usually UV light or always UV light. Uh, and then from the sec to the second level or from the second level, that's often where we see some of the visible and maybe even into the infrared as we go, or maybe just in the UV as we go a little higher. So the four famous you know, spectral lines, the red, the teal, and the violet uh, for hydrogen are coming from three to two, four to two, five to two, and six to two. That's called the Balmer series. Uh, it continues on beyond that. The Lyman series is where we're going the UV lights transitioning down to N equals one. So for here, we're looking at the longest wavelength that of course means the lowest in energy. So we're looking for the smallest transition. Okay, and then also it's looking at emission. So in order to emit light, we need to move from a high level to a lower level. And we know that C is not a choice. We know that D is not a choice. Those are both absorption. So we're looking at four to one from here to here, or we're looking at five to two. Now five to two is the same you know, number gap but it's a very, very much smaller uh, transition, and therefore we expect that to be the longest wavelength. That would be our you know, violet, maybe, maybe, maybe the teal one. Uh, so B would be the best choice there. All right, and then a very similar question to before. This one is a little bit easier to work with. So we have boron, carbon, uh, silicon, and aluminum. And our choices are boron and something, or aluminum and carbon. So we can get rid of the aluminum and carbon right away because we know as we move kind of in this direction that we're getting an increase in electronegativity. And we don't have any quantum weirdness going on here either. So we know that this is the biggest gap and therefore D is incorrect. So we're then looking at, okay, well how do I compare boron with the other three? So boron to carbon and boron to aluminum, but boron to silicon combines kind of the best of both worlds. We have a greater electronegativity because uh, we have more protons, higher effective nuclear charge, but we also have that increase in electron energy levels, and therefore it's going to be a little further from the nucleus. So this is going to have to be better than the, than the comparison of these two, and it's going to have to be better than the comparison of these two. So boron and silicon is the best choice there. Okay, this question, I don't, I don't have a full grasp on how this, what this means, and so I looked into it a little bit. So both of these are the same oxidation state for the central metal ion, uh, MnO4 minus, both of these are plus seven, and they're, they're very similar, manganese and then technetium underneath it. So, so it's saying that the man, per manganate is purple, the uh, per technete is colorless. So normally when we see a transition metal in color, what we think is, is we think of that split d orbital, where, where your two d orbitals that are uh, different than the three, whether they align with the axis or, or in between the axes, uh, are split when they're surrounded by something. Right? And so therefore the electrons can transition between those, absorbing visible light, and therefore they appear colorful. So 
So it turns out that the permanganate, that doesn't work because this is in a plus seven state and manganese has uh, 3D5 and 4S2. So it's basically lost all of its 4S and 3D electrons to the oxygen. So there's nothing occupying these states in order to transition between the two. So when I first read it, I didn't, I didn't realize all of that. And I kind of I didn't see a good answer. I know it's not something to do with isotopes. Um, the elemental magnesium and technetium really shouldn't matter. So I was looking between A and, and C for which one would kind of implicate this. And I ended up going with this one uh, because of the bond being shorter, to me reasoned that potentially it's causing some kind of split uh, between the two because the oxygen is a little closer, perhaps to those electrons or something to that effect. Okay, that ended up being marked incorrect. Um, so then I, I look at it a little bit. I, there's a manganese is absorbing yellow and it's something to do with the type of transition where some electron is transitioning from the 3p orbitals to maybe the 3d, I don't know. Uh, so beyond that, I don't have a great distinction for why A is the better answer. However, I will say that being a stronger oxidant means that it's going to be good at pulling electrons. That magnesium has vacated so many electrons and is so positive and charged, it's going to be good at pulling on other electrons. And that being able to be good at pulling on other electrons also will correlate sometimes to what type of light gets absorbed or emitted or transmitted uh, because you're looking at how an electric field influences influences the transition of electrons. So I don't have a great explanation for how specifically this answers the question. Uh, it ended up being a, I didn't know, and I still don't really feel like I know the answer to that one. Feel free to comment if you have a better explanation than that. Um, and then 49, let's go through the structures of all of them. So we're looking for the longest bond. That means the most single bond character. So the NO plus and the NO2 plus, for me, I saw and said, no, it's definitely not those two. Those are triple and double bonds. Uh, NO plus, triple bond NO2 plus, which we get when we uh, use nitric acid sometimes, which is a good electrophile here. Um, those are just double bonds and triple bonds. So we're really picking between A and B, and we're looking for which one is the most single bond character. So for A, nitrate, we have a double bond, a single bond, and a single bond. And then all of the accompanying resonance structures will go with that positive formal charge, negative formal charge, and negative formal charge. And then for NO2 minus, we have a similar structure. So now we have a double bond and a single bond. So really, this isn't perfect here, but, but the best way to think about this is just, this has two single bonds and a double bond. Therefore, when we average out the actual bond lengths, these bonds are going to be longer than these two because this is the average of a single and a double bond. So there's more single bond characters, single bonds are longer than double bonds, and therefore, A, I don't want to put a confusing color here. A is going to be the longest bond length. Now all the bond lengths in all of these are going to be equivalent, like this is the same as this, this is the same as this, this is the same as this. However, the, the blue nitrate would be longer bonds than the green nitrite, or the NO2 plus or the NO plus. Okay. And the last one, uh, which pair of species have the same shape? So CO2 is a linear molecule. SO2 is not linear. A really simple way to kind of work that is to start with this and then kind of count up formal charge here. So we need a total formal charge of zero. We've got zero on both oxygens. We need zero on the sulfur. One, two, three, four. We need two electrons there. That's going to be a bent shape. And therefore, A is incorrect. B, we're looking at carbon tetrachloride. I'm not going to fill in all of the dots there. Uh, and titanium tetrachloride. I'm going to assume this is a covalent, even though it's a metal, non metal. So we're looking at tetrahedra for both. I'm a little skeptical because I don't do a lot of compounds with titanium, so I just want to go through and check the last couple uh, C2H6 and B2H6. C2H6, we have this bond here. B2H6 is kind of tricky because we have two BH3s. So actually, it's kind of the same structure. This is more of an exercise in molecular orbital theory that I'm not really sure how to draw the structure for. 
So we have two BH3s. There's an interaction between the two borons that causes them to stick. Uh, I don't know exactly why they're not the same shape, but it is two trigonal planar molecules combining. So I don't know if they get into the tetrahedral arrangement the same way as the carbons do. Um, and then, so that one actually is pretty reasonable. I would go with that if this weren't present. Uh, and then nitrate, which is true, is a trigonal planar. Okay, and then phosphite is not, it's trigonal pyramidal. Okay, so B is the best answer. C would be a backup if there were no other good answer, but B is the correct answer. So that's the one we should go.